Welcome everyone. My name is Madeline No, and I'm with NetHope. And we want to welcome you to another NetHope Solutions Center webinar. Today we'll be talking about lessons learned from practical implementations of AI and ML in the international development sector. And we're welcoming presenters today from Catholic Relief Services and from Compassion. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping guidelines for our session today. We'd like, us, we'd like you uh, and us to keep this session interactive. Please post any of your comments or questions in the chat window and we'll curate those for our Q&A session toward the end of the hour today. Uh, after our session, please look for a follow-up email with a link to the recording and any collateral or links to more information on the NetHope Solution Center. And after the webinar is finished today, please respond to our webinar satisfaction poll. We appreciate your input and it helps us make this, these webinars and this series um, better every time. So we appreciate your input. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Layla Toplik, to introduce our speakers today. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, Madeline. Um, I will um, um, I welcome you to the Emerging Technologies webinar series. This is our third webinar in the series of webinars focused on lessons learned from practical implementations of AI. Um, and before we get started with the presentations from um, Compassion International by Dr. Philip Ponolak, who's the Director of Data Science, and from uh, Catholic Relief Services by James Campbell, uh, Regional Technical Advisor for Monitoring, Evaluation, Accountability, and Learning for Southern Africa. Um, I'd like to give you uh, just some context um, on the work we're doing here at NetHope to equip nonprofits with AI and machine learning skills and connect nonprofits to the resources they need to create solutions for international development, humanitarian, and conservation challenges. Um, Madeline, if we can skip to the next slide. So for over, and next slide, for over a year now, uh, NetHope has been leading an emerging technologies initiative um, and an AI working group. We'll share with you the link in a chat window. And the goal here is to grow nonprofits' internal expertise and capacity to evaluate, to develop, to procure, and use emerging technologies like AI and machine learning in their work. And we focus on three work streams. We focus on capacity building. I'll tell you about that in a second. We focus on toolkits and standards. In fact, we'll be releasing one of the toolkits um, this week. And we also focus on supporting practical implementations through collaboration with our private sector and academic institution partners. Um, next slide. So in the context of capacity building efforts, uh, we focus on five areas based on member needs. Um, and do let us know if there are other needs that you're not seeing on this list that you'd like us to uh, plan for in terms of the future webinar series. Um, as you might have seen from the invitation, there's a whole set of uh, webinars and resources we put together focused either on uh, AI and then machine learning capabilities, benefits and use cases. Uh, we've already had a couple of webinars focused on lessons learned from practical implementations. The reason why this is highlighted is that that's the focus of today's webinar. Um, we've been also hosting sessions focused on ethical and responsible development and use of AI. And we'll have a webinar series in May and June uh, focused on AI ethics. Um, we'll be sending those invites soon. Uh, we've also had um, both in-person sessions and um, a webinar. Um, in fact, a webinar that we held in December just a few months ago focused on AI and machine learning tools and services that don't require specialized expertise. And then also we've hosted a number of sessions and workshops where uh, nonprofits have had the opportunity to pair up and partner with the technology experts and begin evaluating and using AI and machine learning for field programs and internal operations. So there's a lot more that you can learn uh, from this link um, that is included on the slide, which Madeline and Seth will be sharing in a chat window, uh, a whole set of webinars and research materials. Next slide. So today you'll hear about 
two lessons learned from two practical implementations of machine learning in the international development sector. Compassion International is exploring the use of machine learning to track the progress and effectiveness of their anti-poverty programs and interventions. And Catholic Relief Services is using machine learning to gain a better understanding of resilience in rural areas in Malawi. And I do want to highlight that each implementation is in a different stage, quite early in a process, but it is important, as we've heard from our members, to proactively share what are we learning uh, from these early practical implementations of AI and machine learning in our sector. So next slide, and that will be the last slide for me, uh, just to give you some context from uh, that you'll see in these presentations, eight questions that each, um, each practical implementation will um, will share. Uh, I do want to alert you to a resource that is available to all of you, which we'll be releasing as part of a toolkit for the sector this week. Uh, we'll include the link to that toolkit um, in the recap email. Um, the toolkit includes an AI suitability framework that provides those in, in the nonprofit sector that are interested in exploring AI and incorporating it into their work with accessible and relevant questions to ask at each stage. And we will pull out these eight questions out of the question, uh, out of the framework of 32 questions to use in today's presentation. And this framework draws on the insights from past and current practical implementations of AI in the sector and has been informed by a, really a diverse set of stakeholders, including NetHope NGO members, UN agencies, technology providers, donors, and researchers, and tested uh, in a numerous workshops and are refined based on those experiences. So we'll send a link to the whole toolkit with um, this framework and with a whole workshop that you can share broadly and also run with your staff. And now um, it's really my pleasure to invite our first presenter, Dr. Philip Ponilak, Director of Data Science at Compassion International, uh, who joins us from San Diego this morning to share the work that Compassion is doing with machine learning. Over to you, Philip. Good morning. Good everyone. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Leila, for the introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, it's, it is my pleasure to represent Compassion International today at this webinar. And thank you so much for the opportunity to share about some of the work that we do at Compassion International. This is a project that I am specifically passionate and excited about. Uh, the focus is on using satellite imagery uh, to do a better and more scalable poverty mapping. And let me start by telling you about uh, the backstory first. So as many of you probably know, Compassion International is a Christian humanitarian aid organization. And our mission is to um, to release children from poverty in Jesus' name. And as of now, thanks to the generosity of our supporters, we are able to provide services to over 2 million children worldwide. And as much as, as uh, impressive it, it is, it is still uh, less than 1% of all the children globally living in extreme poverty. And, and we are dreaming big. Our dream is to see the world without poverty. So we... Uh, would like to employ all the different measures and ways, including machine learning, to help advance that mission, not just for us alone, but for all other partners, all people of goodwill who share the same vision with us. And the very first step is to really understand where there are communities who need most of our help, where there are communities living in extreme poverty. And there are different approaches to map poverty Typically that happens at the country level, but we are really interested in doing poverty at scale and accurately at the sub-regional level, at the level of individual communities. And this is the problem that we are trying to solve here. As of now, Compassion is relying mostly on field surveys and on the knowledge of our local staff to identify uh, poverty and, and the packets of poverty or the areas of poverty. And while this approach allows us to uh, collect uh, highly reliable information, it obviously has its limitations. The main one is the high cost of information gathering. 
uh, and therefore it also is limiting the scalability of this approach and the frequency of updates. So very recently, we have started exploring a new approach proposed in 2016 by Neil Jean and his colleagues from Stanford University, which is using satellite images and machine learning to identify features in the satellite images that will be ind indicative of economic activity. And, and let me try to explain to you how this method works at the very high level. And as a background information, you know, all the machine learning algorithms are designed to do three things. Learn from examples, find patterns in data, and then be able to generalize the acquired knowledge beyond the shown examples. So in our case, uh, what happens is that the machine learning system is trying to take the input signal, which are the satellite images, and as associate them with the training signal, the, the ground truth. The ground truth in our case comes from the local uh, data, typically from surveys. And, and let's say in this particular image, let, let's say that all the red dots in the, in the image at the top represent locations of communities living in extreme poverty under the international line of poverty. As of now, this line is defined by the World Bank as living under $1.9 per day per person. And let's say the blue dots represent all the communities and their locations uh, living above the extreme poverty line. So now what happens is that we provide this inf both information, the satellite images and the training signal to machine learning system, to our machine learning system. And the system is trying to identify different features of the satellite images that will correspond to the values of poverty coming from this training signal. And these features could be uh, a material that the roof of a building is made of, whether this is metal or something different, a, a local infrastructure in terms of roads, electricity, or even just as, uh, proximity to the uh, nearest urban areas. And based on all these features, this, and based on the knowledge that is acquiring during training, the system is then attempting to general, generalize the knowledge that it is acquiring, and is trying to predict poverty levels, not only just at the locations provided in the training signal, but at all other locations within the satellite image. So this is how it works in principles. Now, there is a little caveat here to this method uh, in, in the context of our specific uh, use case. So the, the ground truth signal is typically relatively sparse. As you can imagine, you know, collecting data from the surveys, as I mentioned, is expensive. Therefore, the number of locations where you can collect the survey in the on the ground uh, is limited. And Typically, it's not sufficient to, to efficiently train a machine learning system. In our case, we're using convolutional neural networks, which is a specific uh, class of the machine learning algorithms. And these uh, algorithms require a lot of training signal. So Neil Jean and his colleagues, who first introduced this algorithm, proposed a very interesting approach. They use what is called uh, transfer learning. And they have introduced an intermediate, intermediate training step where instead of first training the daytime images directly on the ground truth survey data, they first train it on the nighttime satellite images. And it is a well-known fact that, you know, the satellite images are a good proxy. It's a crude proxy, not a perfect one, but still a good proxy of the economic activity. The bright areas in the nighttime satellite images correspond typically to uh, wealthier uh, areas, and the darker ones could correspond to poorer areas. Uh, there are exceptions, obviously, and this is why I'm saying this is an imperfect method, but uh, th th what is good about this data set is that it is relatively large, so you can really train the network, uh, in this case, the convolutional neur neural network, to identify certain features. And once these features are identified that are somehow indicative of poverty, then in the second step, a regression method is used to 
uh, eventually identify and predict poverty at different locations within an area. So just to summarize, the data sets that we are using in this example are threefold. We are using nighttime satellite images, the daytime, daytime satellite images, and the ground through data typically coming from the local surveys. And uh, in the pilot study, which we are running right now, we are using World Bank's Living Standards Measurement Survey data, which is publicly available. Not every country has that data, but many, of the, many have. And in the next step, we would like to start using our own Compassion's proprietary poverty indicators that we are also collecting from the, from the field. What you see here is the diagram of our current stage of the implementation of this method. And again, there are two uh, phases to the training of the algorithm. The very first phase is training a convolutional neural network, which is receiving daytime satellite images as, as its input on the nighttime satellite images to generate specific features, which then are coming into the next step uh, to a reg regression model which then is trying to predict the average annual consumption expenditure per image patch. This is the current stage as of today. What is interesting about this method is that you could potentially use multiple other parameters of interest and train the network to predict them. And that could include, for example, the proximity of water reservoirs in the images or identifying the local infrastructure or even predicting, potentially predicting crop yield for a year. So, so this is a very interesting approach with multiple uh, potential use cases. Now, let me talk more about the specifics of our pilot study. As of now, we have applied this method to two countries where Compassion has been providing services for multiple years now, both countries in Africa, Tanzania and Ethiopia. Here are the uh, some examples of the data that we are using in this, uh, in this pilot study, right? On the left-hand side, we see the nighttime and daytime satellite images of the coastal area in Tanzania, both overlaid. On the right-hand side, we are visualizing the locations of uh, the communities from which the uh, service had been taken. This is the training signal that we are using. And similar uh, images for Ethiopia, this is a region around the capital city of Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. All right, so in terms of the results, uh, I'm happy to you know, dive into the details of these graphs offline if anyone has any questions. But for the sake of time, let me just focus on the, on the results themselves. So what is interesting or the most important here are these two parameters uh, or values of the parameter R square, which is known as coefficient of determination. What these parameters tell us at the very high level is that the results for Tanzania are relatively good. The results for Ethiopia are not so good. So for Tanzania, we can use the model to predict over 50% of the variation in the average household consumption. For Ethiopia, we can only explain 20%. And we have different theories about why, why this is so, why the results for Ethiopia are not so good. I, I don't want to dive into all of them, but ju just one quick observation. So this red line represents the international poverty line. And as you will see, there is a huge population of people in Ethiopia living under this uh, line right, living in extreme poverty. And it is a well-known fact that the satellite, nighttime satellite images are not good at differentiating specific values of poverty at such a low level of poverty, in extreme poverty. So this could contribute to why the results for Ethiopia are not so good. And, and there are probably many more uh, other reasons and factors which we are exploring right now. But anyway, so, so this, this is the pilot study right now, Tanzania and Ethiopia using publicly available data. In the next steps, what we want to do is to expand these studies to other countries where Compassion operates and beyond 
and then to start using different kinds of data, not only the publicly available ones, but also proprietary data, the data that Compassion currently has, and data that we can collect to get working together with different data partners, other organizations like Compassion. In terms of the resources that we are using right now, the whole code is implemented using Python on an AWS infrastructure. We are working within a SageMaker environment using the uh, S3 storage uh, services. Uh, I've spoken about the data and uh, right now internally we are partnering. Uh, I'm representing the data science and the innovation team and we are partnering with our global program and frontline church partners. And obviously over time we would like to partner with other external uh, organizations uh, external to Compassion, uh, and I'll talk about it uh, in a few minutes, a little bit more. In terms of challenges and opportunities, there are more, a lot of those. And let me just focus on, on two challenges and two opportunities. So in terms of the main challenges for this method and the potential biases that AI may introduce. Well, so uh, the, the predictive power of this algorithm is obviously limited by multiple factors. The main one is the quality, the uh, uh, recency, and the size of the survey data set. Obviously, the more data we have coming from the local, uh, from, from the ground, uh, the better we can train the model, right? Sparsity of those data may result in low fidelity results, obviously. Uh, similarly, as mentioned before, nighttime images are not so good in terms of differentiation uh, across areas of extreme poverty. And uh, we may consider using some other data, also maybe satellite images, but in a different spectrum of the light, maybe infrared uh, images to uh, supplement this process of, of transfer learning, this pre-training of the model. So this is, uh, this is, these are the challenges. Now, in terms of opportunities, we would like to start combining different data sets for the training signal, for the ground fruit, as I mentioned before. Some of them will be public, some of them will be proprietary. Also, we would like to consider uh, other data sources for the transfer learning. I've mentioned infrared satellite images. There is an, an opportunity to use high resolution aerial images, and there is an opportunity to use other data, for example, cellular data, and so on. Now, how do we see uh, how we can maintain this solution and lead this from a pilot study eventually to a, something that can be used as a, as, as a product? So definitely we need to stay in alignment with our stakeholders. Our primary stakeholders right now are, are, are our frontline churches, our national office partners, we need to make sure that we understand their expectations in terms of the further insights beyond the basics. Also, right now, the process of data acquisition is very manual, and if we want to scale it, it needs to be more streamlined. And eventually, we would like to engage a broader community of, of potential partners, and then we are looking for partners uh, who in, in two areas, so to say. One area is to acquire more additional data sources. The other one are partners who can help us improve technology. Uh, for example, there is an, uh, a startup uh, created by the same people who originally proposed the method from Stanford University. This startup is called Atlas AI. And as a matter of fact, on Thursday, we are having a phone call with uh, the CTO of Atlas AI to explore potential partnership opportunities uh, focus on um, mapping poverty at scale with very high resolution. Uh, and we are also uh, happy to talk to anyone else who shares similar vision to ours, who cares about poverty and about children living in poverty and who would like to uh, learn more about this project and potentially who would like to contribute to this project. And I would like to uh, end my presentation by, uh, you know, sharing about some colleagues of mine and other friends who have helped us with this project. And also here are some helpful references if 
anyone is, is interested in exploring more. Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Philip. As you'll see from the chat window, we have some very interesting questions from the attendees. Please do keep the questions coming and we'll get to them during the moderated Q&A at the end of the presentation. You'll also have the opportunity to connect with the presenters directly. We'll share their contact information. And now um, I would like to um, invite James Campbell from Catholic Relief Services to talk about how CRS is using machine learning in the international development context. Over to you, James. This webinar. Um, good morning, afternoon, or evening to all, wherever you're joining the call from. It's my pleasure to uh, present uh, the work we've been doing in Malawi. Uh, it's called Measurement, Measuring Indicators for Resilience Analysis. And the whole idea is um, we had a project, a DFAP project, a, a, deve a developmental uh, project in Southern Malawi, a Food for Peace Title II project, whose aim was to build household resilience. And so we ran, wanted to come up with a method to measure household resilience. So I wanted to, like to preface my presentation with the admission that I'm not an AI or ML expert. I have a basic understanding of the underlying theory. So suffice to say that I'm at a machine learning 101 level at this time. So recently there's been an increased focus on resilience programming, looking at underlying factors that determine the return. I'm sorry to, to interrupt. James, um, would you mind sharing, sharing your screen so we can see your slides? Oh, I thought it was, I'm oh, sorry. Thank you. Can you see? Is it, are you able to? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, my apologies. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, recently there's been an increased focus on resilience in programming, looking at the underlying factors that determine the return to equilibrium after a shock by households and communities. Um, donors and programming teams have come to the realization that short-term shocks or combination of shocks and stresses can have long-term consequences. So we needed a method to measure household resilience to shocks and stresses. So the measurement indicators for resilience analysis is a multifaceted platform for measuring and understanding resilience, and also for improving and refining resilience programming. And the whole goal or the aim uh, is to model the experience and the effect of shocks exposures and explain the variations in recovery from a variety of shocks observed over time across a specific set of welfare outcomes. In other words, like food security outcomes. So that's what this whole purpose, this whole idea was to come up with a measurement platform for uh, resilience. So in the first few months of 2015, I'm not sure if many of you recall, but they were pictures being sent across the globe of people hanging out in trees and living on top of their rooftops for a couple of days. And there was this flooding that took place in Southern Malawi and parts of, uh, in parts of Mozambique. And there were an estimated two, 230,000 people who were displaced and it also damaged many hectares of land and destroyed the wealth and assets of many. And uh, around that time, uh, you know, our, ourselves and our partner in 2016, once the people started to return to their homesteads, uh, we in conjunction with Cornell decided to set up a proof of concept 
that consisted of approximately 580 households in Chiquaua District. This is one of the most affected districts in the southern part of Malawi. And uh, we set this proof of concept up, up. And then in later on the following year, we found out that we were getting some pretty good uh, results. So following the successful implementation in 2017, we expanded to include two addist additional districts in Southern Malawi, and we recruited an additional, uh, I mean, uh, recruited 2,100 households for this cohort, which we're still following to date. And we hope to have a balanced panel with 36 consecutive months of data by the end of this year. And this approach of the mayor approach basically rests on four interlocking stages, which combine to provide a number of opportunities for both research and programming. So these four stages are the first part, we conduct some kind of qualitative research so we could develop the questionnaires and get a good feel of the context in which we're working in. The next piece is the data collection. And for that, what we do is we start out with a more comprehensive survey, a kind of a baseline survey, so to speak, uh, which we collect. And then following that, we collect monthly high frequency follow-ups and basically just collecting information on shocks and key indicators. And then we have the research and analytic parts. And this is where the, we're working with our, our partner, Cornell, and this is where the machine learning fits or comes into play. And then the last piece of this whole approach is the community engagement piece, because we sh share this information back with the community, and I'll speak some more to that a uh, little later. So the approach, like I said, was developed to focus specifically on the resilience building aims of this Ubali project. Uh, and the Ubali project, like I mentioned, was a five-year food for peace development food system program that was implemented by us Catholic Relief Services in southern Malawi. The project had a number of uh, overlapping interventions aimed at reducing uh, malnutrition and building re resilience. And given that MIRA was deployed alongside this project, the Ubali project, we were able to make comparisons between uh, part project par participants and non-participants. However, since this wasn't designed as an impact evaluation, we could not make any causal inferences, but only identify or speak to the correlations that we identify. So, as mentioned, uh, in the beginning of the presentation, one of the questions that we were asked to talk to is why is AI better than the current solution? And um, in our case, I'm not so sure if, I wouldn't necessarily say AI is a better approach because in our case, using machine learning did not reduce costs or improve the quality of data. We use it solely for analytical purposes and we found out that it, it improves the accuracy of our predictions. So basically it just offered us another way to analyze our data. Because we also use some regression analysis and some other approaches as well in, 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 as part of this whole process. And if you look, the illustration that I have here, uh, titled Change in Performance, what we would do is just a comparison of the prediction predictive performance between using a standard linear model and using the random forest model, which is one of the machine learning algorithms that we employed. And the results show a net improvement in the performance when we use the random forest algorithm across most indicators that we collect. And if you look, we collect, like I said, food security indicators. We collect the household hunger score. We, we collect information on the reducing coping coping strategies index. We also collect information on the household dietary diversity score and the food consumption score. And then essentially what this looks at how this works is uh, these performance metrics look at how accurately the different methods predict food security, insecurity, in terms of quantifying false positives and false negatives. 
So what is our solution? So as I mentioned, we kind of, and for this, like the analytics, as I mentioned, we evaluated two machine learning algorithms, lasso and random forest. And we use these for two different purposes. One was to predict responses to shock, and another was to inform targeting. So as you can see here, this table shows the results of an exercise to identify the top predictors of food insecurity. And these came out to be previous food insecurity is a very strong predictor, but so are indicators like distance to drinking water and the quality of housing of the household, which is something that the previous uh, presenter mentioned, uh, as our location indicators like living in the floodplains, which is kind of, of interesting because as living in the floodplains give people access to both richer alluvial lands for agriculture, but it also makes them more susceptible to flooding. The other thing we looked at is the predictive capability or capacity of this approach. So this map shows a comparison. If you look on the left, I uh, cut it out. This, this is the actual, what actually happened. And then if you look here, you could see a comparison between what the predictive al algorithm generated regarding the food security situation and the actual food security situation. And what you see is a pretty good correspondence be between the two. And right now we, we see temporal predictive accuracy comparing across time. And as a next step, and we're currently working with a couple of, uh, of research partners, we're interested in seeing how this data can be used to make out of sample estimates by incorporating additional data such as weather and market data, which will allow us to make inferences about food security elsewhere within the region. And another predictive exercise that we explored was to try and use machine learning algorithms to inform targeting. In other words, we wanted to determine which households should beneficiaries of targeted interventions should, should be uh, the base beneficiaries of targeted based on their reported assets and indicators. So we wanted to see if we could use this to help inform programming. And in the di diagram, we have this decision tree, which is based on the random forest model, where we use the defined set of criteria. Households are classified into categories to determine whether or not they are poor or sufficiently food insecure to warrant project support, because they would be in the lowest quartile, for instance. And uh, what, what we see here, key determinant that we identified as part of this exercise was whether or not a household owned any chickens, which turned out to be a key indicator of wealth for this particular cohort under study. And the other decision nodes highlight other relevant splitting points, such as location or number of crops the households were growing. So again, we could use this information and share it with our programming team to kind of help inform our programming and interventions in which areas we should kind of focus some of our, our project activities and interventions. And then I spoke of before, some of the data that our solution requires is our focus variables are well-being outcomes like the food security uh, indicators that I mentioned and shocks experienced that had adverse effects on households. And here we're looking at both covariate and idiosyncratic shocks. So the shocks that affect pretty much the entire, the community at large versus those idiosyncratic ones which affect individuals like a death in the household or lack of food for a particular household or a sickness of uh, the main breadwinner, things of that nature. Also, capacities and characteristics that may prevent adverse effects or enable recovery. So these are some of the things that we collect on a monthly basis with a high frequency data. And then the process involves, like I mentioned, we first collect a baseline survey, then a monthly data 
collection uh, high frequency survey, which is we use a digital platform, Comcare, and we we have what well, we've trained enumerators that are embedded in the community. So they live in the communities where this data is being collected. And one good thing about that is that we, in doing some research when we were setting this up, we identified that for other people who tried to implement these panel type of study designs, there are high levels of, of attrition and one reason is because of the numerators used to come from outside the communities and come into the communities. But here, most of these enumerators, they know the people who live in the in those communities. And so we, we've been collecting this information for 36 months, well, 28 months now, and we have a very low attrition rate. And again, like I said, this is a panel design, so we collect information from the same households across these three districts. In, in, in Malawi. And then the whole empirical challenge is we, again, want it to be resilience focus, low burden, generalizable, and accessible and useful. And this is one piece where we feel that since the, the community, uh, the, the enumerators live in the community, we share this information back with the enumerators who then share it with the community at large. And uh, by working closely with these community-based enumerators, uh, and we generate these reports, and they share them with the village development committees, and then they in turn share it with other members as well as district-level personnel from the Lyme Ministries. And we've been getting some good results as the communities have used this information to identify priorities and develop community action plans. And several communities have told us that they share this information with various other NGOs and other groups which have responded by providing their respective communities with additional support. You know, for example, one community observed that there is an extremely high prevalence, prevalence of livestock disease and they shared this data with the local NGO that assisted the community by purchasing medicine and vaccines to inocul inoculate and treat their animals. So that's one of the, the positive results of this, where we share this information back with the community and they find it useful. And then what resources do we need to support the development and impl implementation and maintenance? Of course, from the technical side, we have our research partner, which is Cornell University. And uh, they're the ones who have been supporting the research and the analytics. And then, like I mentioned before, we're just now uh, formed relationships with some folks, researchers from the University of Illinois and uh, University of Illinois and University of Texas. And what they're interested in is, is taking a deeper dive with the machine learning and to also do some uh, spatial analysis. And like I mentioned before, what we want to do is see if we could collect some additional data. Um, like some uh, marketing data and some other data to see if we could use it to make out of sample predictions. In terms of our non-technical support, we have like a field supervisor. And then we have the community engagement piece, which I spoke of. Uh, and we work closely with the v VDCs, the village development committees, and the village civil protection committees. And some of them are also just happen to be some of the enumerators as well, which work works fairly well for us. And then in terms of biases, well, one thing that I wanted to share is just an example. This is an illustrative example. Uh, this graph shows a recent, this shows the average monthly rainfall received in one district in southern Malawi, where we're planning to expand and roll out uh, Miro for another project. And if you look, the, um, the graph of this uh, shows the monthly average monthly rainfall for the past over the past 10 years or so in this particular district. And if you look, the amount of rainfall, the amount of rainfall that they receive, like I said, we started this exercise in 2016. So if you look, 2016, 2017, 2018, 
2016 and 2018, they had not so much rainfall. 2017, was they had a little bit more. But if you look and see, you could see that the, the amount of rainfall was received between 2016 and 2018 is far less than the amount of re rainfall received in 2019 in the first month or so, or first this part, the rainy, during the rainy season in 2020, which may be an outlier or with climate change now prevalent, it may be the new normal. So clearly the most recent rainfall data are very different from the previous, uh, previous data. And then this kind of raises an obvious question regarding the introduction of bias in our machine learning algorithm to predict household vulnerability um, to certain shocks, let's say floods. As with the current rainfall levels so markedly different from the training data used to predict future outcomes. So we were, we were using this data, like if we use the 2016, 2017, 2018 data, and we train, use this as our training data, we might be off or introduce some bias when we come to predict uh, some of the outcomes for 2019 or 2020. So this is just like an illustrative example of something that I, I feel how we could introduce some potential bias. And the key takeaway here is if you use bias data to train your algorithm, machine learning will only reinforce or amplify those biases. And then now our approach to maintaining the solution. Recently, we are awarded a Microsoft uh, AI for Humanitarian Action Grant. So we're currently working with Microsoft to develop a plug and play machine learning solution that any project which implements this protocol can utilize to identify household characteristics, driving food insecurity and to predict future outcomes. So what we wanna try to do is like, if everyone follows this protocol, then we could have a plug and play where now we have to work through researchers or work with a research group to do this. And then we're gonna see if we could develop uh, some other metrics and, and other tools uh, to, to kind of to, to really look into, to get some solid information in terms of predictions uh, of food insecurity and to perfect, predict future shock outcomes. And then, Microsoft is providing us with technical support. In other words, we are working with their data scientists. And then, in us, like I mentioned, we'll also maintain the relationships that I mentioned before with these other research institutions, Cornell, University of Illinois, and Texas. Our next steps is we expanded and established a cohort in the southern part of Madagascar in 2018, and now they're implementing this protocol. And we're gonna expand it again uh, soon. And then additionally, we're initiating a partnership with USAID, the World Bank, Concern Worldwide to scale up this approach in nine additional districts in southern Malawi. And we've also been talking to the government of Malawi and they've expressed an interest in adopting this protocol to track the progress of, a, of its national re resilience strategy. And uh, that's the end of uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, James, uh, for your excellent presentation. As a reminder, we will share the slides and the recording with everyone in a recap email and also on the Method Solutions Center also, uh, just quick reminder, as I'm seeing a number of questions coming through in the chat window, Philip and James shared lessons learned from their practical implementations of machine learning by answering these eight questions from our AI suitability framework, which all of you will have access to. And these questions are good for both sharing lessons learned, but also for evaluating AI for new uh, programs. So I will... Um, start with a few questions and uh, Madeline, if we uh, click to the contact slide, we'll make sure that you have contact information for Philip and James so you can follow up about other questions you might have or poten potential partnerships. 
So our first question is for Philip, and I'm going to combine a few questions into one, uh, Philip. Um, so once Compassion International, Philip, has these models that you're comfortable with, um, how do you plan to use them to inform your programs and interventions? For example, would you use this to either include or exclude communities from receiving assistance based on how they're classified by the model? And what level of precision would you want to see before using the results for targeting purposes? And somewhat, somewhat related question um, is about your approach um, to fairness and privacy in the deployment of machine learning for poverty mapping. So if you can uh, comment on these questions briefly. Thank you. Of course, of course. Thank you. Great questions, very good questions. And I want to be careful when replying to this first question about how we want to eventually apply the results of these tests or this uh, study to deciding on which communities include in our programs. Compassion has a very uh, stringent and multi-factor evaluation process when it comes to deciding on where to allocate uh, resources, where to specifically focus uh, on with our services. And I, I want to mention one thing. We work directly with local churches and these churches eventually work with the children in poverty in need. So this is a two-step process and it's been a, a very good model working very well for multiple years and we want to continue that way. And I would like to uh, think about our approach as one of the factors that will contribute to a decision that will be eventually made by our global programs on how to effectively allocate resources. Obviously, there are different communities living under different conditions. Uh, the World Bank's definition of extreme poverty is just one dimension, but there are multiple dimensions. And we would like to be able to help address this one particular dimension of uh, related to um, the financial, let's say, poverty aspect. Uh, and eventually the program will decide how to, how to weigh all these different factors. So I, 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 I'm sorry if this answer isn't uh, very specific, but uh, as I said, this is just one factor out of many that will eventually decide on how to allocate resources. Now, the second part of this question uh, about the fairness and privacy is, is also very important and we care very deeply about protecting the privacy of all the beneficiaries of our program and all the local staff. <clears throat> uh, in this pilot study, we have used public data only. And the survey data came from the World, World Bank's Living Standards Measurement Surveys, where instead of providing information about each individual household, uh, World Bank has created clusters of approximately 10 kilometers to average the results and anonymize uh, the individuals to protect their privacy. So in case of our future work, when we would like to work with our own data, obviously when we use uh, first party data for our own internal use, we have agreements with uh, all the different parties and we can let's say, uh, provide better granularity in terms of identifying packets of poverty, but still obviously with uh, respect to pro protecting privacy of all the parties, all the uh, individuals involved. When eventually, let's say, we work with other partners and would like to make this uh, approach available to others as a product, as a service to use, we would employ all the necessary means to definitely uh, protect the identity and privacy of, of all the parties involved. And that may mean that the granularity, the resolution of the approach will uh, have to be somehow weighted by the fact that we want to protect privacy. Uh, and there is a trade-off, but obviously privacy is very high on our priority list. Great. Thank you, Philip. And um, as it's, it's good enough for right now. And I would encourage uh, the attendees to follow up with Philip directly. And also, as a reminder, we'll have an AI ethics webinar series with three 
webinars planned for May and June, and in fact, one of them on June 18th will be focused on fairness in machine learning, and we're collaborating with MIT and USAID on this webinar series. So a question for James, and there's some really fantastic questions for James, uh, which I hope if we don't ask all of them, you'll be following up with James about that. Um, James, one of the questions is related to the findings from your analysis, for example, that chicken ownership is an indicator of uh, household wealth. Do they align with learning from consultations with the community members? And also, were there any findings that surprised you and the program team? Um, with the first one, what we do with all of the information that we collect, like I said, a, a major a major component of, uh, of, of this approach is to work closely with the community. So a lot of this information that we, that we, we get, we share with the community, but we also go back and we try to validate this information with, with the, the various communities. And so what we would do when we are developing, when we get this information, we go back to these communities, we validate it, we find out, because I'll give you a good example. We, like I said, we continuously ask people about certain shocks and stresses. And then the, the application we use, it, it's a case management system. So we could ask a household, we could say two months ago, you mentioned that this was a problem. Is this still a problem? So in some of the data, we had to go back because we found out that people were mentioning that, you know, they're still affected from a drought, but now it's during the rainy season. But then when you go and you ask them, you find out that because of the drought, they're affected now because they, they didn't, weren't able to, to have any maize or, or whatever their standard staple was. So that's how they were still impacted by the drought even months after the drought had ended. So we go back and we share a lot of this information back with the community to validate it before we, you know, before we, and, and, and I guess after that we validate it, then we could use it to inform programming. All right, thank you so much, James. And I'm gonna ask one, I'm gonna ask both of you to give a um, 60 second answer to the next round of questions. So Philip, you're up next. Um, if you can talk about, um, um, just, there are two questions related to the data, how large were the samples you used for the training, and what was the resolution of the satellite images, so very briefly. All right. Uh, in terms of the size of the sample data, uh, I suppose this is mostly the question about the survey data and per country, about in the case of Tanzania and Ethiopia, we used uh, around 500 data samples and each data sample represented a cluster, not just a single household, by, but a cluster. In terms of the resolution of the satellite images, huh, that's a very good question. I would need to go back to the original data, but I believe this is at the level of uh, under 100 meters resolution. Thank you, Philip. And I'll ask uh, those who are asking the questions and need additional information to follow up with Philip or James directly. And James, um, a question for you related regarding the models. Um, is there any other plan to increase the accuracy of the model apart from adding weather data? 56% um, is not bad model-wise, but for decision-making purposes, that is still 44% of unexplained. And then what types of decisions can one be comfortable making given these 44% to ensure that the current model is still used? Can you comment on that? Well, yes, and this is what I said. We're currently working with uh, some researchers from University of Illinois and University of Texas. And one of the things we want to work on is like how reliable this information is and to see if there's other things we could add to the model to increase, you know, the, the accuracy of, of this model. So this is something that's still work in progress. And, and th like I, in terms of like what types of decisions are we comfortable making? That's why I was saying, I mean, one of the things that we, even though this is exciting work, but most recently, I've been talking to a couple of, of, of co-workers, and one thing that I mentioned that I think it's important, that I think we need to kind of take a step back 
and then like reevaluate to see exactly how reliable, how robust these models actually are, because that's one thing that we haven't really done at this point. So this is something that we're working on. This is work in progress. And this is something that we hope to address. And hopefully in the next few months, we'll, we could have a, a, a better answer uh, or give you more. Yeah, and James, that's a, that's a super important message for all who are considering using machine learning or might be already uh, piloting with machine learning. So with that, um, I would like to thank um, Philip from Compassion International and James from Catholic Relief Services for sharing lessons learned from their work with machine learning in the international development sector. Um, huge thanks to um, all of our attendees who shared some really, really important questions and do follow up with Philip and James if you have any additional questions or would like to partner with them. Thank you all for joining us this morning. And as Steve noted, we do have from the NetHope AI Working Group um, with excellent support from Catholic Relief Services, we have a repository of AI and machine learning uh, resources, solutions, um, analytics um, that we put together for COVID-19 response. We'll share that also in a recap email. Thank you and um, take care, stay safe and healthy. Bye. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye. Have a, have a good day. Thank you for attending. Please take a moment to complete our webinar satisfaction poll. The link is in the chat window. And don't forget, you'll receive a follow-up email with links to all of this information and the recording of our webinar. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.